remaining time is uh, first want to answer uh, any specific questions you have uh, regarding uh, any of the 34 rules and their decisions. And then after that, Bill is going to uh, take us through some uh, questions from the practice exam. And you know, feel free to ask us ask us specific questions of your own from the prac uh, practice exam as well. So, uh, before we hand it over to Bill, any uh, questions? Yeah. John, yeah. I had a situation a few years ago where a fellow competitor ran over the ball, so I okay. picked it up and dropped. Next day, I was told, you know, you should have placed it. All right, yeah, yeah, that that's a good and uh, difficult question. How do you is there a rule of thumb for things like how do you know when you drop? How do you know when you place? How do you know when you have one club length, two club lengths, uh, as near as possible on a line and so forth? And it's it's difficult because there's not always a clear um, uh, clear uh, reasoning behind that and dropping and placing. I don't know, Billy, you can tell what you think, but I'm not sure there's a easy rule of thumb. And the, the one, it, in my experience, the times that people most get mixed up with dropping and placing is first your situation. When you had a lie altered through the green and you drop instead of placed, uh, is, is 20, rule 20-3B would say you should place. That that's a pretty a common misconception. Another one I'd say is under 24-1. If your ball is on a movable obstruction, say a blanket, and you lift the ball, some people will try to place the ball under where uh, where it lay on the blanket instead of dropping it. Um, the other situations, I, uh, you know, I those are I think the two where most people get hung up on, but I'm just, I'm poor. I, I really, really wish I could give you a quick rule of thumb, but uh, I'm, I, I'm just not sure, sure there is one. Wouldn't that have been a penalty on me? Because I did. Yeah, yeah and actually, uh, no, that's all about it. That's a good well, two strokes. Two strokes. Two strokes. Yeah, so that's a good question. Let's, so, uh, so the question is, let's say, I'm sorry, did you say you ran over your ball or someone no, else did? Guy. Okay, no, so uh, uh, an outside agency runs over your ball line through the green and beds it in the ground. So let's uh, walk through everything. It's a good question because there are several different rules involved. Mm -hmm. You know, first, is there uh, any penalty? Well, first, what's happened? An outside agency has moved your ball. It's moved it downwards, and direction of movement counts. Uh, so there's no penalty to anyone, and the ball has to be replaced. So how do you replace the ball when the original lie no longer exists? Uh, then Rule 20-3B will tell us that uh, as your ball is lying through the green, you'll place it in the nearest, most similar lie within a club length, which would say if it was a fairway of uniform uh, uh, conditioning, it would be pay, place, it, place it a few inches away and play. And, but instead of doing that, you actually drop the ball. So uh, that would be the penalty, and stroke play would be a, a two stroke penalty in, in, in that case. Well, John, if you don't. I kind of, in my mind, anyway, I mean, if, if Steve saw this ball run over, if you didn't see it, you kind of knew the lie, wouldn't you? Wouldn't that kind of predict the placement? If he didn't see the lie, wouldn't that kind of predict the drop? Well, I, I tell you, you raise a good point in that you, uh, in order that in this particular case, <coughs> that we, you, there can be a conflict between 20 dash. 3B and 20-3C, where the original lie could be altered, and you don't know exactly where the ball was, where you have two different rules. Because lie altered would say you should place it, and not knowing the spot would say you should drop it. And we say, well, if you knew the lie, you should place it, and so forth. But in this case, when you see someone run run over your ball in a fairway, you know you you know the spot. Because the presumption is that ball just went straight down, uh, and uh, and also, I think it's it's fair to say in the fairway, especially these days with you know, golf course condition, it's fair to assume there was a clean, normal fair, fairway line. But, but it's, it's a, and that's a good a good question that um, I even you know the the best rules of fiddles they have to stop and think about that one about, about what happens. So not knowing knowing that he ran over it. But not knowing the lie, you still place it. 
Yeah, but business. business. I would think you would drop it because you don't know. Where well, in in that case, you get into dropping only if you don't know where the ball was. That 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 note at the you end of twenty. You know where it was because you was run over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, so you know where it was, and the lie, you're you don't know for sure. But as I said, I don't think it's out of the question to assume that it was a normal fairway lie in a situation like that. Is it, let's say if, if, if this happens in the rough where the ball could have been you know, on the ground, it could have been an inch up, then you know, you're not going to know the line, you're not going to know the spot, and then, then you would drop it in that case. Can you, place it, can, you, can you place it at the side, or do you have to place it behind the spot where it was? Nothing. All right, all right. So, so, this is a good, good question, Jim. The, so when, when you go to place the ball in the nearest most similar lie, where is that? Because let's say it's just uniform fairway all around. Then what's interesting is you're going to have a number of nearest most similar spots. They all could be within, you know, say an inch uh, radius. And in that case, really, I think mean, you could say if they're all the same, <coughs> you get to choose. You go to the side, you go, to go left, you go right, you go behind. Because if they're all the same distance, uh, I think, you know, it's as What is the spot? How do you determine a spot? You said inches. Well, I, I depending on the size on the size of the indentation of the created uh, was not pitch mark but embedded mark. All right. Let's say there is no indication, just that the spot was in that general area. Well, yeah, I think the question is when the ball has been pressed into the ground, so the ground has been disrupted, so the player had a flat, clean, fairway lie. So now you're going, you need to move away from the crater to get another flat line. So that's what I was talking about. It could be an inch or two away, probably. But you could not repair the crater unless you hit. Someone might say you improving your play. Well, and what's interesting with repairing the crater, it to some degree depends as to where you wind up placing the ball. If you place it to the side, it could be in some cases that then the repair of it wouldn't improve anything. Possibly. Steve, in, in this spot, I mean, this situation happened and the ball ran out of Did the ball move or did it just depress? I would think it just went down. So I, I would venture to guess in our senior events that happens five times a year. That exact scenario. But isn't it almost always in the rough? Yes. And when it's in the rough, you're never going to know the spot. You're never going to know the flight size. So the short answer is you're almost always going to drop off. Well, I would I'm disagree. Not sure I would say oh, you never. Find in the rush, yeah. you still might be I ran over a well, drive the ball in the middle of the fairway. I just wasn't, okay. even, I had no, okay. wasn't even thinking about where his ball was. I was trying to get to mine and just ran over mm -hmm. that person's ball. Do you think you're qualified to play in these events? No, not at all. That's why I'm here. I, I, I want to try to get qualified. <laughs> yeah. but, but, got, you know, it's just just say, but Dan's point is right that often uh, when Balls are run over often will be in the rough when you don't see them. And in many cases, you will have a case where that conflict between 20-3B and 20-3C. And so in many of those cases, you would wind up dropping the ball uh, in that case if, if you didn't know the original lie and don't know the spot. I have a quick question on going through the green, the uh, all the 500 questions I'm working my way through. Um, it says in one of the questions, this is paraphrasing, through the green question of playing two balls, uh, they're playing match play, question of playing two balls, no claim made. The answer to the question is there's no penalty. But the note to number two, uh, rule two dash five, the note in match player, he may not complete the hole with two balls. So that's a oh. violation of the rules. Well, okay, yeah. well, let's look at uh, two examples of that, Dean. First, or Tim, let, let's look at um, first example have not involving two balls, where let's say you and I are playing a match, and on the um, fourth hole, you see me remove a pine cone from a bunker. You don't say anything about it. And we go on, finish the fourth hole, play the fifth hole, and then five holes later, someone uh, 
the spectator uh, raises that question. At that point, can, is any penalty applied? At that point, there's no penalty because you were aware of the facts. The fact that I removed the pine cone, you didn't make a claim. So now, let's say you and I are playing together. And I hit my ball into an area I think should be ground right there. And I say, Tim, I'm going to play uh, two balls in case I, because I think I'm entitled to a loop. And you just say, okay, you know, do what you want, John. Um, or you, you just say, okay. Um, and then we finish out the hole. Then several holes later, we come to an official and we say, hey, back on hole number four, I played two balls. What's the ruling? Well, first, you know, true, by playing that uh, second ball, that is a wrong ball. Normally, that's a loss of hole penalty. However, you were aware that I played that second ball, that wrong ball, and you hadn't made a claim about it before we teed off on the next hole. Just gets down to the basis of whether the guy makes the claim. Yeah, so you exactly. you the rule altogether in this case. It's, it's a match player can be two different things. It, it is a breach, but whether there's a penalty is applied depends as to whether a claim is made. All right. Makes sense. <laughs> so anytime a guy plays a ball under 3-3 three, three in match play, you make a claim that you just play the ball, uh, made a wrong ball. You, you just hit a wrong ball. You lost the ball. If you make the claim. If you don't make the claim, right. you're absolved of anything. But if there is a penalty, I mean, yeah. potentially there's a penalty in match play every time you invoke 3-3. Three, three. There's a breach. Yeah, yeah. There's a breach, not necessarily okay. a penalty. You know, we're we're going to go over this in the very first question of the practice exam, <laughs> and you know, another question that we're going to talk about is: so the player that does this, the other player doesn't make a claim. What's the score for the player that did this? And that'll be covered in the question. Okay. Uh, anything else? On that before uh, uh, Bill gets gets into the practice exam. All right, let's not hear while we switch spots. We have a museum. Oh, we Okay, hopefully all of you have your practice exams. And Tim, that couldn't have been a better segue. We don't. Uh, into uh, the practice exam. Uh, we'll start with question number two uh, on the practice exam of the closed book section. And the question is, in match play, a player is doubtful of his rights and announces that he will play a second ball. He declares the ball he would score with if the rules permit, plays the second ball, and completes the hole with both balls. His opponent makes no claim. What is the ruling? Well, there's three answers on all of these. <laughs> A, there is no penalty, and the score with the selected ball counts. B, there is no penalty, and the score with the original ball counts. And C, the player has played a wrong ball with a loss of hole penalty. Uh, does anyone have a stab at the correct answer? The Most of the people in this room, if not all of them, have the answer sheet. And the correct answer is B. And John alluded to that. No claim was made. So now it comes down to what's the score for the player who proceeded uh, under a rule that he's not allowed to proceed under. Well, it's always going to be the original ball because the score the second ball is not played in accordance with the rules. So whatever that score would be, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, is the score that that player would be stuck with on that hole. Uh, if, if there's no points about that question, we're going to move quickly to question number five. Uh, this is something that happens quite often in tournaments. Uh, Question number five is, when the committee suspends play because of heavy rain, the player's ball lies on the putting green. He does not mark the position of the ball, nor does he lift the ball. When play is resumed, the player finds the ball in a bunker. What is the ruling? Answer A, the original ball must be played from the bunker. 
Answer B, the original ball must be replaced on the putting green. And answer C, a ball must be placed on the spot from which the original ball was moved. And this, this actually should be something that is unbelievably easy. Play will always be resumed from the spot at which it was discontinued under Rule 6-8. And a player, whether he's lifted the ball or not, is entitled to play a ball or a substituted ball on the spot in which play was discontinued. So the correct answer is C, and hopefully that is some something that all rules officials are pretty familiar with, particularly when you know this is something that happens probably five to ten times a year. Uh, we have a suspension of play, and if you were at last year's state junior. We had uh, suspension of play, I believe, every day. The first day because of a storm, and each day following because of darkness. Uh, but uh, any questions on that particular question or any other? Uh, moving forward with question eight, and this is something that is uh, very important to know, order of play as an official, when two players take relief from a water hazard. The order of play is determined by, and I promise you, if you go to a USGA uh, PGA workshop and take the exam, you will see this question. A, the relative positions of the balls before relief is taken. B, the relative positions of the balls after relief is taken. Or C, the relative positions of where each ball last crossed the margin of the lateral water hazard. And the easy way to remember this, unless a player is required to proceed under stroke and distance, it's always going to be the position of the balls before relief is taken. And so the correct answer there is A. And that is under the note to Rule 10-1B if it's match play and Rule 10-2B if it's stroke play. Uh, another Good question that I, I think comes up quite frequently, and I know I see players do this quite often, is question number 12 uh, with regard to the putting green. In, the, in which instance may a player purposely <laughs> touch his line of putt without penalty? Answer A is with his hand when repairing the ragged edge of the hole. Answer B, with his club in removing casual water. And answer C, with his hat in removing a leaf. Uh, all of these are, are, the first two are covered by decision. The uh, answer A is decision 16-1A-5, uh, which prohibits touching the hole. And it, it's kind of funny. I, I probably see five to 10 players a year pluck grass from the edge of a hole and you know I always my take on it is I'll walk up to them and and say it, it looked as though you were grabbing loose impediments around the edge of the hole I uh, just want you to know you can't touch the inside of a hole uh, one player that you know quite well does it repeatedly and several times a year uh, answer B is covered in decision 16-1A-1, and I hope all of you had the correct answer, which is C, which is uh, with your hat in removing a leaf. Uh, you're simply removing a loose impediment by any means without pressing anything down, and hopefully you all got that one correct. Uh, Bill, I have to follow up on your, your, your player that you seem to know violated the rule. What you seem to be saying was you prepared to give him a warning and a slight lecture and so forth. How how do we extrapolate that to other situations? I mean, it sounds like in your example, you knew damn well that he violated the rule. A lot of times you don't. You're you're 30 feet away. You see him doing something by the hole. You don't know whether he's picking up loose grass or whether he's plucking. You have a 
Um, you know, I'll liken this to a situation that happened in a tournament we ran with the uh, Wisconsin PGA and Mason Crosby, the kicker for the Packers, played. And on the very, it was his very first golf tournament. And uh, one of our officials was on the first hole, and uh, Mason Crosby's caddy was standing very close to the extension of the line of play behind his ball. Mason Crosby hit his approach shot onto the green, and the official walked up to him and simply stated, you know, please add two strokes to your score for uh, a breach of Rule 14-2. And uh, I, I guess that's a pretty harsh way. And I kind of consider who's playing in terms of how harsh I would be in making rulings. I think a way to handle that, is it a penalty without question? You know, if, if this were a PGA Tour event, state open, state amateur, without question, you would penalize the player. Given the notoriety of the player and knowing it's his first tournament ever, you know, I think a way to handle that could be walk up to the caddy and the player and say it appeared as though your caddy was close to being on an extension of the line of play. I just want you to know that that's not permitted under the rule. Make sure you move off of that line. You know, because if it becomes a question of fact, the caddy could, you know, he might say after you walk up, say, well, you are on the extension line. No, I was only, well, close to it would still cover in the rules, but he could say, you know, oh, I wasn't on that line, then you are now into a, what I would call a pissing match, where you can use it as an educational basis. It, part of it, you know, how would you handle working the high school girls tournament as opposed to working the state open? I, I think you'd be very different in the means of which you approach players and, and conduct yourself as an official. Uh, yeah, and you know we've had talks a lot of times. I don't think players are aware that you can't touch the inside of the hole or the edge of the hole, and that's why you say oh, it looked like you picked mm -hmm. up a loose impediment. I just want you to know you can't touch the actual hole itself. You know because people will there'll be little strands of grass, and the player I'm referring to is about as anal as they get, and <laughs> a little tiny bug flying around would well, drive them crazy. Know, know. Uh, <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's best to use the educational yeah, approach yeah. <laughs> and try to teach them that way. Uh, and a very important, you know, Doug, if you're working a U.S. mid-amateur, there's no question. You'd walk up to a player, you touch, it, it appeared to me you touched the line of the hole. The player is going to say, yes, I did. No, I did. Yes, I did. Well, I would like to inform you that's a two-stroke penalty under rule, whatever. You know, the one thing I always try to teach officials, and I hope all of you, when you give a player a penalty, it isn't you giving the player the penalty. It's the rules of golf, and you simply say to a player, you breached rule X, and the penalty for that breach is X. You know, one of the, the great things that I think John Morissette has always done is keep the personality out of it, deal with the facts, and try to take the personality out of it. You know, whatever the breach is, a player breached a rule, and you, you yourself are not penalizing them. You're simply saying the player breached rule X, and the penalty is whatever it is. Yeah, so I, I, I did, Dan, but, you know, back, kind of back, back to your question, if a you know, if a player does breach a rule, regardless of the level of the play, you know, you're, you're going to tell them, sorry, you've breached the rule. And so forth. what Bill's talking about is how you approach the player and say, uh, you know, that that can depend as to the level of play and so forth, uh, how, how you, uh, you know, uh, how you approach the player. But if, but, you know, if a player breaches a rule at a junior event or at U.S. Open, you know, he, you know, we need to apply the rules uniformly at uh, events of all, of all, all level. So, no question. You know, you're the official, and you said, uh, I think you were touching the, uh, the hole, you know, like, and the player says, no, I didn't. Now what? 
you know, again, if it comes down to a one-on-one -on -one situation, there's a decision that talks about you side on the, the yeah. side of the player. Um, yeah, but I, one thing where, where that can be different is when an official is involved. Uh, because, remember, part of the role of the official is for himself to determine questions of fact. So, uh, and we won't say reference Andy and so forth. <laughs> but, you know, if an official, it, if it comes down to an official saying, you touched the inside of the hole and the player says, no, I didn't, I, I would lean towards the uh, official's testimony because that's why, why he's there. I, I think another side question that, uh, is, they teach it in the rules of appreciating one on one. Ask the question, don't say, I thought I saw you touching the inside of the hole. Did you? You just ask the player, um, can I just ask what you were just doing? And people would say, yeah, there was a little, the, the edge of the, the hole was raised, and so I was just panning it down. Correct. Well, now you've, you've established the fact about leading the player. So as much as you can, ask an open ended question and let them give them the facts. If they say, there were a couple of loose impediments right around the hole. Okay, well, that's what the person believed they were doing. If they say, yeah, what was raised, I patted it down. They've given you the facts. If you tell them what you think you saw, they're going to know, ooh, how do I answer that? Yeah. Correctly. But not every official does it, like you say they should do that's it, because, I mean, I've seen an official happen with a uh, Hall of Fame player on a the state open, and, you know, he came up and said, you touched it, that's a penalty. And he said, no, I didn't. Now, it was a confrontation between the two, official and that. And he said, there are other officials here, too. It wasn't just you like that. Did anybody see this? Never. Nobody else saw it. <laughs> so it was just between those two. So uh, I think they ended up with the player in that case, like that, even though an official made the mistake of her judgment uh, of what happened. I think Doug has a great point. If you ask the right questions, oftentimes you can get the answer out of the player, and I, I call it letting the player hang himself. And move forward to question number 14. Uh, in stroke play, a player's caddy accidentally deflects the player's ball in motion after a stroke. Answer A, the player incurs no penalty and the ball is played as it lies. B, the player incurs a one-stroke penalty and the ball is played as it lies. C, the player incurs a two-stroke penalty and the ball is played as it lies. The correct answer, uh, as of, I believe, 2008, after Jeff Mager uh, in a bunker at Augusta, uh, but the answer is B, it's a one-stroke penalty, uh, whether that be match play uh, or stroke play. So that is something to think about as well. Uh, moving forward, question number 15. Uh, in singles match play, the players share a motorized golf cart. In searching, the moving cart strikes and moves a player's ball. What is the ruling? Answer A, there is no penalty if the moved ball belonged to the player not driving the cart. B, there is no penalty regardless of who is driving because the ball was moved during search. Answer C, the player driving the cart loses the hole. Correct answer is A, there is no penalty if the moved ball belonged to the player not driving the cart because when the cart is being moved, the cart and everything in it are to be considered the equipment of the person moving the cart. So the other player's ball, or the other person riding in the cart, it's not his equipment. So there'd be no penalty. Uh, moving forward, uh, question number 18, what is correct regarding the player cleaning his ball? Answer A, he may not clean the ball when lifting it from casual water. B, he may not remove cut grass adhering to the ball lying through the green. C, he may clean the ball lying through the green when it has been lifted because it interferes with play. The correct answer is B, he may not remove cut grass adhering to the ball lying through the green because at that point it's not a loose impediment, it's something that adheres to the ball. Uh, obviously, you can clean your ball uh, under any circumstance when you lift it except for three reasons. 
Uh, rule 5-3, a ball unfit for play. Rule 12-2, lifting it for identification. Or rule 22, because it interferes or assists with play. As the other reason. Also, to determine if it's embedded. Uh, yeah, to determine the application of a rule to see if it were embedded in a burrowing animal hole, et cetera. And that's under a decision. Uh, question number 19, what is correct regarding a player and a ball interfering with or assisting play? And, and these are something that you'll see on a USGA test uh, for sure. And these are a little tricky because you have to know who is lifting, whose ball it is, and what have you. Uh, but in any event, uh, question, I mean, answer A, he may lift another ball if he considers it might interfere with his play. He, answer B, he may lift his ball if he considers it might interfere with the play of any other player. And quest, or answer C, he may lift his ball if he considers it might assist the play of any other player. And the correct answer is C, he may lift his ball if it considers it might assist the play of any other player. Answer A is not correct because you can't just lift another player's ball. Uh, if it might interfere with your own play, you have to ask that player to lift his ball or you may ask the player to lift it. And answer B is not correct because uh, he may lift the ball if he considers it might interfere. Uh, the other player would have to ask you to lift it. You can't do it of your own accord. Uh, moving forward, uh, question number 22. In stroke play, a player hits his ball into a lateral water hazard. He correctly identifies where his ball last crossed the margin of the lateral water hazard and measures two club lengths from that point. He drops a ball which lands just outside of the two club length area. For example, two and a half club length from that point where the ball last crossed the margin. But the dropped ball rolls back into the area that is within two club lengths of where the ball last crossed the margin. He then plays the ball. And that's kind of key in this question. The player, answer A, has proceeded correctly and incurs a total penalty of one stroke under the water hazard rule, rule 26-1. Answer B, incurs a total penalty of two strokes under rule 26-1. Or C, incurs a one-stroke penalty under the water hazard rule and an additional penalty of two strokes under rule 26 for playing from a wrong place under that rule for a total penalty of three strokes. And the correct answer is C. You know, there's a key where it isn't where the ball wound up, it's where the ball was dropped. And if you remember under rule 20-2B, where the ball has to strike a part of the course, is where the applicable rule requires it to, to strike the course. And in that instance, it's within two club lengths. And even though the ball wound up within two club lengths, it was dropped. There's a great example as an official. If you see a player do this, under rule 20-6, have the player pick up the ball and drop the ball correctly. And the question would be, as an official, would that initial drop count no. The answer is no. But there's also another key there, and that is not forgetting the penalty stroke for 26-1. Correct. Yeah, if you're taking a test, obviously the player has played from a wrong place under Rule 26-1, which is a two-stroke penalty. But a question might be how many penalty strokes. And remember, the one penalty stroke for proceeding under the water hazard rule initially and then the two-stroke penalty for a general breach of playing from a wrong place under that rule. Uh, the very next question, rule question 23, a player briefly searches for his tee shot, declares the ball lost, and tees another ball. His original ball is then found in a water hazard less than five minutes after search began, and more importantly, before he plays the teed ball, what is the ruling? Answer A, he must play the teed ball as the original ball is deemed to be lost. 
Answer B, he must play the original ball or take relief under the water hazard rule. Answer C, he must take relief under the water hazard rule. Well, the important thing is declaring the ball lost means absolutely nothing because under the definition of lost ball, that is not one of the five ways a ball can become lost. Uh, the fact that the ball was found within five minutes after the player had begun search for it is the key. So that still is the ball in play. The fact that he teed up a new ball is immaterial, and the correct answer is uh, because Answer B, he must play the original ball in the water hazard or proceed under the water hazard rule itself, taking the one stroke penalty under that rule. Uh, question number 25, which is correct, regarding a player proceeding under the unplayable ball rule. A, he is not required to find and identify a ball as his before he can deem it unplayable and drop it within two club lengths of where it lay, not near the hole. B, he may drop a ball in a hazard if he deems his ball to be unplayable through the green. And C, he may deem his ball unplayable anywhere on the course. You know, as you go through these or any test, you try to eliminate the questions or the answers that you know not to be true. Answer C is not true because a player cannot declare his ball unplayable in a water hazard. So anywhere on the course, that answer is eliminated. Uh, obviously, in order to declare your ball uh, unplayable and to use either option B or C, B being dropped behind the point where it lay unplayable, or C dropping within two club lengths, requires you to find the actual ball, which identifies the spot at which the ball is unplayable. The only time you don't need to find and identify your ball uh, when proceeding under the unplayable ball rule is if you proceed under option A and return to the place where you last struck the ball. Uh, so hopefully that's a, a fairly easy, straightforward. Now we move forward to the open book question, and uh, we're going to go to question number 29. And, and this becomes an order of play, and you'll see several questions like this on the exam, and I picked this one out because hopefully you don't get it wrong after we discussed uh, the question in the closed book portion. But question number 29, in a match between player A and player B, both players hit their tee shots on a par three hole into an area where their golf balls are likely to be unplayable. Player A's ball is 50 yards from the hole. Player B's ball is 40 yards from the hole. Both players deem their ball to be unplayable under Rule 28. Player A drops it under Rule 28-C, meaning within two club lengths, from where it lay unplayable. Player B proceeds under stroke and distance and returns to the team ground. Who should play next? And while this might seem as an official crazy, player A, because he was initially away, and the player B is not required required to return to the T, he elected to return to the T. Therefore, player A would play first, even though his shot will be played from a point closer to the green. Uh, that may seem illogical, but the key there is whether the player is required or elected, and in this case, the player elected. Uh, the next question, question 30. Uh, regarding the team ground, in a match between player A and player B, player A drove the ball out of bounds from the wrong team ground. Player B did not recall player A's stroke. Might want to question the integrity of player B, but obviously he wants to win this match. What is the ruling? Answer A, there is a two-stroke penalty for playing from the wrong team ground, and player A must now play his next stroke from within the correct team ground. Answer B, there is a one-stroke penalty under Rule 27-1, and player A must now drop a ball as nearly as possible to the spot where the previous stroke was last played, meaning the wrong team ground. Answer C, there is a one-stroke penalty under Rule 27-1, and player A must now play from within the correct team ground. If this were 
a stroke play competition, answer C is correct, but the question is in a match. And the correct answer is answer B. Uh, and the point there is, while the player played from a team ground, he did not play from the correct team ground. And so therefore, what part of the course did he play from? He played from through the green. And when he played from through the green and you're proceeding under stroke and distance, rule 20-5 would tell you you would drop a ball as nearly as possible at that spot. Uh, regarding what you said about stroke play, though, pardon? Regarding what you said about C and stroke play, that it's a two-stroke penalty. And oh, yeah, it would be a two-stroke penalty, and you'd be required to correct the error. Correct. That's absolutely correct. Uh, moving forward, question 38. A player's ball comes to rest against a movable obstruction, both of which are lying through the green. The player lifts the ball and drops it away from the movable obstruction instead of removing the movable obstruction as provided in Rule 24-1. He then plays from that position. What is the ruling? A, there is two-stroke penalty. The general penalty for a breach of Rule 18. Answer B, there is a one-stroke penalty under Rule 24-1 for not following the proper procedure for that rule. Or answer C, there was no penalty as the player was entitled to relief from the immovable, from the immovable obstruction. And the correct answer is A. Uh, the player would have been required to replace the ball back at the spot, not play from a new position, and therefore uh, the correct answer is A, uh, basically moving a ball and playing from a wrong place under Rule 24-1. And it even says at the end of Rule 24-1, otherwise the player, uh, if you look at that last sentence, and in this case, that's what the player did. Uh, question, question number 39. A player's ball comes to rest on the apron of the putting green. Mistakenly believing that his ball is on the putting green, the player marks the position of and lifts and cleans it. What is the ruling? Answer A, there is a one-stroke penalty for a breach of Rule 18-2A for lifting his ball without authority under the rule, but no additional penalty for cleaning the ball. B, there is a one-stroke penalty for a breach of Rule 18 2 2A for lifting his ball without authority under the rule, and an additional one-stroke penalty for cleaning the ball. C, there is no penalty as the player thought he was on the putting green and therefore entitled to lift his ball. Hopefully none of you answered C. This is an, <laughs> this is an open book question. This is an uh, open book, uh, and hopefully it's a very easy one. This is actually covered in decision 18-2A-13, the correct answer is A, there is a one-stroke penalty. And the thing there is to remember, a ball may be cleaned any time uh, when lifted, except for three reasons, which we mentioned before. Uh, believe it or not, Gene, you may remember this, but Mark Wilson did this at Cherokee Country Club when he won the state amateur in 1996. He, he lifted his ball, uh, whoever the official was, on the whole, gave him a two-stroke penalty, one for touching it, one for cleaning it. And I think you quickly reminded him this decision was in play even back in 1996, and the penalty was only one stroke. Uh, and there's probably nothing better as a player learning that what you thought was a two-stroke penalty <laughs> becoming a one-stroke penalty. Uh, we'll move forward to question 44 under obstruction. A player elects to take relief from an immovable obstruction in a bunker. He lifts the ball to take relief without penalty under the first option of Rule 24-2B, uh, 2I. And, and that would be the first option is A, which uh, basically means taking complete relief inside the bunker at no penalty. But he realizes that where he will have to drop the ball will result in a very difficult shot. He changes his mind 
and now elects to proceed under the second option of Rule 24-2B, 2I, which is item B, which is dropping outside the bunker, keeping the point where the ball lay in the bunker between you and the hole, but uh, taking a one-stroke penalty for doing so. Uh, keeping the point where the ball lay between, uh, where the ball had been lying in the bunker between the spot on which the ball, uh, on which he <laughs> dropped the ball outside the bunker and the hole. What is the ruling? Answer A, the player incurs a one-stroke penalty for not following the correct procedure under Rule 24-2B, 2I. Answer B, the player incurs no penalty as long as the player had not yet dropped under any of the options under Rule 24-2B, 2I. He may use either of the two options under that rule. Answer C, the player incurs a total penalty of two strokes for playing from the wrong place under Rule 24-2B, 2IA, because he was required to use the first option when he stated he would do so. And the correct answer is B, the player would incur no penalty. The key there is that he changed his mind before dropping the ball. If he had dropped the ball and be required to redrop for some reason, the answer would be very different. He'd be limited to that option. <coughs> Moving forward to question number 47, uh, under Rule 27, ball lost or out of bounds, provision of ball, a player plays his second shot, searches for his ball briefly, and then goes back and drops another ball under Rule 27-1. Before he plays the dropped ball, and within the five-minute search period, the original ball was found. What is the ruling? A, because the original ball was found within five minutes of the having begun search for it, the player may, under Rule 20-6, correct his error by lifting the dropped ball and playing the original ball. B, because the original ball was found within five minutes of having begun search for it, the player has the option of either playing the original ball or choosing to play the ball dropped under Rule 27-1. C, the player must continue with the ball dropped under Rule 27-1 because of the player's intent to proceed under stroke and distance. And this is one time where a drop ball does become the ball in play because of the player's intent to proceed under a very specific rule that he's allowed to proceed under at any time. Does this intent follow goes off the tee and he teed the ball? He the same result. He teed the ball and played it. No, he's no, teed. He not played. Not, 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 not still not played. No swing. No swing. No swing. No swing. It's very close to the question that we just intent things kind of. Yeah, but he hasn't put a ball in play yet. No. You know, the key there is understanding the definition of ball in play and which ball is in play at that point. Uh, the very next question, question 48, in stroke play, a competitor believing his tee shot, point A, the team ground, might be lost, correctly announces and plays a provisional ball. He finds a ball he believes is his original ball makes a stroke at it, picks up his provisional ball at point B, which is the point where the provisional ball came to rest. He then discovers that the ball he played was not his original ball, but rather a wrong ball, which is point C, the place where the wrong ball came to rest. <laughs> he resumes search for his original ball, but he cannot find it. Where should the player make his next stroke from? One could argue any of the places, depending on what penalty he would like to take. But if he'd like, <laughs> if he'd like to minimize the penalty, uh, this is covered in decision 27-2B-9. And uh, the correct answer is point B. Uh, and the reason for that is when his original ball became lost, 
his provisional ball would have become the ball in play, irrespective of the fact that he had picked that up and proceeded to move forward, he would have been required to replace the provisional <coughs> ball and that ball itself on that spot from which he picked it up, which was point B. Uh, this actually, as I mentioned earlier in the session, actually happened on the 16th hole at University Ridge, where we're going to have a field trip later this spring. Uh, but in any event, we'll move forward. And the last question, question 50, a player deems his ball unplayable. Of the three options available under Rule 28, he elects Rule 28C and drops the ball within two club lengths of the spot where it lay. The ball, after being dropped, rolls and comes to rest nearer the hole than its original position. So the player is required by Rule 20-2C to redrop the ball. May the player now proceed under a different option under Rule 28, for example, Rule 28B, keeping the point where the ball lay between him and the hole, uh, and the spot on which the ball is dropped with no limit to how far behind the point the ball may be dropped. Well, let's go through the answers. Answer A, because the player has not yet made a stroke at a ball dropped under option C of rule 28, and the ball subsequently rolled into a position requiring a redrop under rule 20-2C, the player may choose a different option under rule 28. B, the player must lift his ball and redrop it using the same option as when the ball was first dropped under option C of Rule 28. Answer C, because the player decided to change his relief option, he incurs another penalty stroke under Rule 28 and may then choose any option <clears throat> under Rule 28. And the correct answer is obviously B, he is redropping uh, under the original option that he selected, and if he chooses another place, he would be effectively uh, lifting and dropping in a, a wrong place. So the correct answer is B. Gary? Bill, if he had dropped the ball over his shoulder, which is a, a, like an improper drop, then could he have changed the loop options because it wasn't, uh, didn't fit one of the seven reasons why you have to redrop? I would think the answer would be no, because he's dropping under a specific option, but he would be required to correct the improper drop. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the scenario is we talk about the one time you can change options when uh, dropping again is when you've dropped in a wrong place, because that's a case where you really haven't dropped under any option, so you're starting from scratch. But otherwise, if you've dropped in a right place, you need to continue to drop in that place under that option. Um, other than that, if, if there aren't any further questions, uh, I just want to thank all of you that have come in each and every week for the last two months. And uh, also for those of you that have joined us online, I know at least 15 to 25 people each week have joined us online. And uh, I know on behalf of Jeff and myself and the entire staff, uh, we could not ever possibly do all the events that we do with the success that we do have in running those events without all of your help and we sincerely appreciate it uh, and more importantly i, I want to say thank you to john morissette uh, without question we are very very lucky to have arguably the most knowledgeable person in the world with regard to the rules at our disposal and, and i know I lean on them quite a bit, and I know a lot of other tournament people lean on them. And uh, John, I can't thank you enough for helping, and we should all consider ourselves very lucky to have someone like John uh, teach us the rules of golf. And I know he's made a, a great difference in, a, in the scores of a lot of people that have taken the test after listening to him. And, and so, John, we want to thank you uh, very much for taking all this time. And, we certainly want to thank Aaron Hills for allowing John yeah. <laughs> to, to come each week. Well, and certainly, and we'll, we'll, we'll thank you all. And first and foremost, thank everybody for attending, whether in person or online or watching the recordings. You know, just when you know, see the same people each uh, week 
come here, you know, in some, you know, sub-zero temperatures on some snowy mornings, I think that says an awful lot about uh, the WSGA and the volunteers we're so lucky to have. And, and that's exactly why, rules-wise, we have, you know, one of the very strongest associations in the country, even with our modest size, and we should take pride in that. We're lucky to have uh, rules-wise and outstanding staff here. I'm not sure if there's another association in the country, uh, regardless of size, that has as many uh, good that has as many people on their staff who have done as well as uh, our our association has. So uh, that's uh, great. You know, the uh, encouragement. Uh, uh, to get uh, that the staff has to keep up with the rules uh, and that a adds a, a tremendous amount and from a personal perspective just thank you all for the opportunity to keep this part of my mind engaged and you know, frankly just to spend a morning each week you know with a group of friends talking about a fascinating topic that's uh, very enjoyable and i'm going to miss it and i apologize in advance that uh, i feel like i'm not a very good uh, co-chairman of our Rules Committee, since I'm not able to officiate many tournaments during the summer when you know my job uh, kind of keeps me tied down uh, more so. But that's nice of you for my convenience to bring the state amateur to where I work <laughs> this, this summer. But uh, and you know, to those of you joining us uh, from a distance, uh, thank you all uh, very much. I know there have been a number of very good officials, U.S. Open uh, caliber officials, who've uh, uh, joined us and sent nice notes, and that's extremely flattering. You know, we're uh, to know that you know we can be of any help uh, uh, for that. So thank you. And as we look at things for next year, our tentative plan is to do this again next year, since it is a rules change year and a decisions change year, focusing on those changes, and then have, especially since we have recordings, maybe uh, do that every other year or something like that, because. As some people have said, well, what's the point in coming to hear in person exactly what was said the year before, um, which, which is a fair point. And <laughs> frankly, in 2017, that could be somewhat of a busy year for me <laughs> also. Uh, but, uh, but with that, uh, for uh, those of you here and joining us online, please uh, continue to give us your feedback, uh, things you'd like to see uh, for next year. Be different again. You know, this is not intended uh, to uh, replace, uh, you know, say the PGA USGA workshops or multi-day workshops conducted by associations, in which we're going to conduct in April. About which uh, an email will be going out next week uh, with uh, uh, details for signing up. But it's just intended to be a, a, a informal, comfortable review and what we can do to uh, make that better and more enjoyable, uh, uh, please let us know. But uh, thank you all again, and I hope uh, we all have a uh, terrific off-season. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>